There are times when it feels like one leg is a who and one leg is a what. Um, that in between, it's the who's still around, um, doing its old tricks. But there's a sense of observing that. There's a sense of feeling more of a unity with everything. And I wondered if you could help a little bit in how to deal with an intellect that wants the answers, that there is a, there is a plan, that there is a purpose, even when nothing seems to fit and everything is kind of dreamlike and nothing quite works. The old doesn't work anymore because you know a little bit more. And the new isn't solid enough to be able to look back and see all of this kind of gray area behind. Other than no panic, uh, maybe you could address that a little bit. The plan is already set up by nature. It's not going to change for none of us. The environment has a model that will constantly remind us from now to midnight eternity. And that model is a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. And the evidence that butterflies don't rot, but caterpillars rot. That will be here to remind you, as a human being, what you are and what you have to accomplish, like it or not but you volunteered for it. You're not drafted, you were drafted before, and you rebelled, all of us. But then the compensatory condition came up to clean up after we rebelled, and the reward is a type of body that will provide us total permanency, like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. But we have to surrender all the who's, all the miraculous powers of our mind to do one simple fact, act what we say, like it or not. That plan will never change. So our brothers will say to us, as they confront us over and over, not my will but thy will be done. And to him that overcome it, I will not send forth a second time, but make you a pillar in the house of the Lord. The DNAs and RNAs are already set up in this particular model body to accomplish it. But it's not going to be accomplished by miraculous abilities or something for nothing attitudes. It can only be accomplished by <coughs> the slow confrontation of facing moment-to-moment -moment life. You can't live tomorrow, and yesterday is gone, but you got to live now. 
and know is what you see, you have to act. That's the plan. Mm -hmm. Adama, what's a something for nothing attitude in the sense of... Uh, a passenger in a car <coughs> likes to tell the driver how to drive the car. <laughs> <laughs> That's the something for nothing attitude. The initiate is the person who is given the key to drive his own car and has to respond to the rules of the road. And the key to the car is we lock you into the capability of reactivating your mouth to the atoms so your actions come back to confront you very fast to clean up your act. So could something for nothing be even like a lot of people that go into the world searching through different methods to find answers for themselves rather than go within? That's They're right. trying to always find it outside? Is that like something yeah. for nothing? You see, if you say something and you don't act it, what good? Then the, way back in time they used to say, the code of the West. You ever heard that? Code of the West? What, did it, what is the code of the West? A man's word. A man is only as good as his word, right? And that is from the dawn of time to now has been the reminder of all the teachers of truth. If you have faith in me, like a brain wants to see, you say to the mountain, move. That's your mouth telling the atoms, move. Well, how many mountains do you think you can move before you create earthquakes? <laughs> so then you see that into practical either. What is practical is coping moment to moment with your various confrontations and the moment-to-moment -moment confrontations are set up like a script in a movie. Each one of us are actors, and we have a script to act out in the movie called Creation. And the script is only the scope of the horror, the cult horror scope. From the time you come in to the time you go out, how you act it, you get the spiritual Oscar. Well, Adana, if we kept our word more, wouldn't we then not always have to have confrontation? Isn't Does the confrontation come because causes are set up by not keeping the word? Yeah. So if you keep your word, you shouldn't have to always have a life of confrontation. That's okay. what I say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The stars foretell, but they don't come tell. Mm -hmm. They can't come tell if you live your word. But then you don't live your word, you'll be forced to face the confrontations of evading it. Or? Does that include your moods? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but there are confrontations. It's right there. <laughs> Do, what would be the direct way to turn that off? When your confrontation is usually yourself. And you start getting to the point where you're actually aware of it, but, but you feel kind of compelled to go ahead and play it out anyway. Is there, do you say something? I mean, is there an immediate action that you can take? Yes, no, no maybe. <laughs> yes, there is an immediate action you can take. From the time you made a statement and you realize that you can't go through it, you can cancel it. Then no, you've already made the statement, go through and find it if you can cope with it. And maybe it will make you more aware that you don't make statements prematurely that you can't live. Yeah. So you have to all have all three confront you. Then if you're in a quandary, is which one to act out? You flip a coin and two out of three, you act it. <laughs> now you get your ego out of the way. That was the uh, Western version of the I Ching. <laughs> Teaching in a long pile of ways to talk to yourself, yes, no, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just making it simple for you to <laughs> get your ego out of the way or the conflict of your intellect and your five senses to your memory and uh, act the unified process.
You need that, Penny. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, I, I, <laughs> I mean, you, it's a quicker way to find out if what you are living is valid. Anytime you are in a quandary to make a decision and don't know if it's to your best good or not, flip the coin, tell yourself two out of three, and you act it. No, the, no matter how it may feel very uh, threatening, whatever the coin does, and that's a, a quick way to the teaching was like that to oracles and all these things that we want to get. But I still have to decide. But here's a fast way to go through the whole thing and clear it up in your mind. <laughs> that your ego is out of the way. Uh -huh. Two out of three, act it and see what the outcome is. Even though you may want to go the opposite direction and feel you're more confident to work, and yet when it pops up, you may have to go. Uh, nine times out of ten, if you live out one experience where you don't act what you think you would like to act, in a strange way, Nature abhors a vacuum. She'll give you all the bonuses in a way that you never believe it'll come to you. Mm -hmm. The things that you think you denied yourself by doing the other action, and you could have got more by going the opposite way, nature in her own way will make this compensation. That's what we call it, compassion. You don't know what compassion is or grace is until you have to face the issue and sometimes negate the shortcuts to take the long journey out of it and come up smelling like a rose because the whole environmental soul comes back pouring it like a bonus on top of your head. I have had to done it myself many times to see it and test it. Otherwise, I think it's just an imagination. But it's an actual law underlying denial is necessary for you. Denial is just having to choose one thing over another. Yeah. Jesus could have run away from the cross. He had the foresight to see it before it occurred. And yet, he knew it. Why should he kill himself for these fellows here? They don't really love it. But he went ahead and lived it. And he got his reward. Today, we're still arguing among ourselves. Did he come here? or is a figment of our imagination. We got a piece of cloth that looked to seem to have a, some diagram of his face. We're still asking ourselves with all kinds of technical equipment if it's a fraud. We don't have a, a bone to show that he was here. And yet, 366 uh, human bodies that lived after him, just accepting his attitude of living, are not rotting. That we got. So something is uh, here to tell us, maybe there's something working in the laws of physics that we don't tap in as yet or understand too well, but a caterpillar will make you realize it all through eternity, and all it does is eat its way to butterflyhood. Okay. So that eventually makes you a human being reflect upon yourself. That maybe we are selling ourselves a little short, and not to get too much in a quandary or too vindictive, we should try it more or less balance down or ease down and look at ourselves a little more objectively as to what we are versus who we are. I know we are always hurt and we don't get the respect. And that's because 99% of us are suffering from a terrible disease called ATG. Oh, right. ATG, Attention Getting Syndrome. <laughs> it's worse than AIDS. <laughs> that doesn't exclude me too, you see, I'm included. We all like to promote ourselves, but you see, when we don't know what we are, and we're so over-programmed as to who we are, we get lost in it. And then we have to come back and re-evaluate what we are, then this frees us. And basically, you take the very structure, that's why Jesus said, as brother who said, seek ye first the kingdom of God which is within you. Now look at how you put together. That's the structure, that's the kingdom, that's the storage bin. How you 
and its laws, its righteousness, that's how it's operating. It'll free you. In other words, intellect, senses, will slowly have to evaluate between the intuitive truth and the memory bank and act out the actual mechanics and you'll be a free person, Lord of yourself. But I haven't found anything called SELF. But I found a uh, CELL, Lord of the Self. You become in control of this temple. Fact number one is, losers can be born when you look inside of yourselves. The sperm that got to the ovum is a winner. Fact number two, you can't use the ovum twice. Every ovum is a virgin. Fact number three, when they cut the cord from mother and you don't breed on time, they throw you in the garbage. And fact number four, you can call yourself a loser all your life. You can call yourself a loser all your life, mm -hmm. but you're born a winner and uh, no use ovum since you're always your pristine, prime, brand new. And you're standing on your two feet with the coptic cord because you got to breathe on your own. Nobody got to breathe for you. Therefore, those facts tell you that you made it. And why? The cells are there to confront you, but your mouth and all those around you who program you with their mouths can make you feel that I believe you're a loser. But if you don't let the mouth of others bug you, <laughs> and you just listen to your own mouth and look at the facts of how you're put together, you're a winner. And so the plan is that you will make butterflyhood, which means conscious immortality is an actuality within this cellular structure. It's the only type of body provided to achieve non-decomposition. Take it to you and leave them puzzled where you're gone. Come in and visit your brothers and sisters and say, Tata. Walk through the wall and get them bugged in your head. But those are just a few of the wonderful opportunities we have. But we have enough evidence of that already. And it's not something that is denied us. It is something that is locked up in us. But those who have experienced it, are the ones who've gone through the one important fact. They act what they say. They don't evade that. They don't try to get around it. And I know it's a very difficult process to act what you say, because there is no commandment, thou shalt not lie. But thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. But as far as you are lying to yourself, you're entitled to that. Mm -hmm. But don't lie about others. Solve your question. <laughs> See the plan? <laughs> you don't want the plan I want. <laughs> so you want uh, prosperity without action. Uh -huh. Is that it? No, it's like, I, I guess the ego feels like there's some grand purpose for this existence other than just being like the rest of Mother Nature. The grand purpose is that God became us, but well, we don't know it because we are endowed with individuality to argue back with ourselves 
in the individuality. Take away the individuality from this structure and you don't have any quandary in your consciousness no more. Because you have individuality, you have a quandary. If you were to take away your individuality, you'll be a fetus stuck to your mama and you're 100 years old and she may be two, three hundred years old if she never dies. And let alone, if you never had individuality, you'll never come out of Papa to go into Mama. That's facts why this whole process is set up by the creative intelligence to play his own game from a unified field of the atoms to enjoy individuality. But he can't take it back. He knows he can only experience his nature by acting through individuality. As a unified field, who the hell needs to worry about? That's God already. It's called intuition in you. It's called memory in you. But for it to be an image, a Xerox copy, something to look at itself, it would have to take the role of individuality. Therefore, it will have to disengage itself from its unified nature. And it can't say, come let me make a manifestation because there's no me. It's come let us make. That's a pluralistic statement already set up. You can't make one sperm into a human being. And you can't make one ovum into a human being. You gotta get a sperm and an ovum. You can't take two sperms to make a human being. You can't take two ovums to make a human being. So this is a pluralistic principle set up. Einstein would call it relativity. Eastern uh, yogis may call it maya. Whatever word we use to describe the reality of nature's law, there is no way that one singular function can entertain itself in a unified field. It has to have individuality projected out of it to look at itself. And in that statement is where we are confused in the individuality because that's the whole idea. By confusing the consciousness with individuality, it never will go out of business. <clears throat> and so since the creative intelligence, when he designed the whole process to become his creation out of the unified field, to give it individuality and say, come let us make man, which really means come let us make a manifestation from the sonics and optics representing sound waves and atoms that have no other geometry than moving light in a resonant field of ignition and detonation, slowing down to be a manifestation as a physical universe to look through a physical process of a mechanism to evaluate it and as a walking simplistic model called a human body, this individualistic principle is unique, but it can't revoke it. You can tell that ego, shove it. And daddy said, okay, I'll smash your head and take your breath out. But what are you going to do with the breath? I have to give it to you and take it back. Nine times out of ten, he wants to give it to you back. Because who is he giving it to? He's giving it to himself in the individualistic state in order to converse with his own self. So he's happy for you to be what? A rebellious son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> and you're glad that when you have a father image role to play and a mother image role to play, your child is just as rambunctious, nitty gritty, hard headed like yourself. That's what individuality is all about. You're entitled to egotism because it's all set up for you to be super I. And put on the big charade called the universe to play. But then, if you stay out there too long, go forth, multiply, that means to Xerox yourself, and have dominion but don't have no franchises. <laughs> so, 
I don't want you to stay out there too long. I want you to come back and appreciate. So creative intelligence doesn't have no intel, uh, intention to go out of business of providing the opportunity for individuality to play the role of confusion and ask for forgiveness. It's a neat game. Okay, that, that brings up just one question. Yeah. How about guilt? Misapplied decision? Think of that one first before you call it guilt. A sister once said to me when I met her years ago, wonderful, wonderful, glorified person. She looked at me, she said, Adam, when you know God, all your good and lousy decisions will be fulfilled. Therefore, you'll never suffer from what you call guilt. Mm -hmm. To this day, I don't have guilt to suffer from because I have lived my good and lousy decisions. But my lousy decisions were necessary for me to appreciate my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, why we are caught in decision and there is no sin? You have five senses. Then you have an intellect that tells you how to function with it. Then you have a memory that stores. And then a logical relationship of reason to relate. And yet you have an intuition that can scan the whole thing and save you the misery of making incorrect decisions. So we're all working from the level of the five senses, the intellect, to the bridge between intellect to the intuition and memory by trying to be prophets so we can profit on controlling time. But we goof with, by being too psychic, too miraculous. And then we come back to realize that it's not in the miracles according to Paul, it's not in the gifts of the Spirit where the truth is, it's in the understanding, the actual fruit of living, the actual evaluation of living the moment. There's, that makes you a free man, not of yourself. Because then your individuality takes on a greater dimension. Not in the terms of rebelling and feeling guilty for your mistakes, or the misapplied decisions, or trying to make restitution. The individuality provides this quality that no other opportunity can provide. And I'll tell you what it is. God, the creative principle, can now be a constant manifested form that will not break down in his own universe as a tissue mechanism in an element called carbon. At the early stages of it, it's a charcoal. At the intense, improved state, it's a diamond. And every other element in this entire cosmos has to pay respect to it. Even that glass made of silicon can last for eternity. Next to a diamond, it'll crack up. But a diamond wouldn't give way to that glass. Both will allow light to pass through. That silicon, a model of its life form is the moth. From the time it comes out, it runs to fly to that light to die. The caterpillar comes out and all he does is eat his way and then he spins a cocoon and now comes out another creature that can fly. There's nothing more beautiful that can fly than a butterfly. He doesn't decay, he doesn't fly to the light, but put the two together and you'll see the principle of a silicon which is a glass, and a diamond, which is a carbon. And therefore the Creator is happy to live in his cellular individuality if and when the cellular individuality builds the temple. Build me a temple that I may dwell within. He's giving the intellect in the cellular form from the you intuitive nature to the memory bank, the opportunity to rise above the five senses and its logic 
here in order to be totally permanent here, free to go in and out of the atomic structure without any limitation. So you look at your comic book, Superman is a forerunner. Only one problem with him, he comes from Krypton. <laughs> you are a carbon-based body. You have the golden opportunity, but you feel inadequate because of the clumsy things you think you have done before now. And that's what makes you feel guilty. But you know something? There was a blind man that was brought to your brother Jesus to be healed by him. And they asked him, who sinned that the man be born blind? Did the man sin that he born blind or his parents sin that he born blind? And Jesus said, neither. He wasn't concerned if he was born blind from a mistake he did in a past life to warrant the return called karma or reincarnation. Neither he wasn't concerned that the parents made a mistake and they reaped the reward of their mistakes in a child that is born blind. He pointed out a fact about the individuality inherent in the structure that we didn't look at. He said, this is to the glory of God. Meaning, I, Jesus, living in this moment of time now, confronted by this man who is blind now, who has been pushed into a position to make a decision that you jokers think you're going to trick me with my individuality, I'm going to shut you up and let you look at yourselves that you don't even know what you've got. So you know what he did? He spit on the floor. He rolled up the dirt with that spit and stuck it in the blind man's eyes. He says, now go and tell no man. But you know what can happen. Picture for one moment, you knew me. Come down the road like this. Adana, can I help you? <laughs> and then all of a sudden you see me walk. Adana, how can you see? Can I run down from you or can I talk to you and tell you that this guy here? I'm stuck. My individuality is going to do what now? Virtually, <laughs> right. And here it is. So here you see how he threw it back on themselves. But what was great in them, they had to recognize that they could use it now. Not the magical powers, but the resolution of their fears and frustrations to live life now without fear and accept the simplicity of life. <laughs> I know it's rough. <laughs> but if you go through it, my brother, there's nothing better. Everyone in this room are winners. Losers can be born. But you know, among winners, we have to have what is called <coughs> respect, so we call it laws and order. <laughs> so the plan is very unique when you think of it. Because from the plan, in, out of it emerges selfless service or unconditional love. Now, God is unconditional love and is selfless service in a unified process. But in an individualized mechanism, how are you going to do it? Unless somebody aggravates you, where you like to clobber the heck out of them, but then, by the same token, you reflect and say, maybe I can try this unconditional service and see how it will work. <laughs> yes? We, we have a history uh, of making poor choices according to our own individual viewpoint and our own lives. What can we do to change the pattern of making poor choices and poor decisions? The blueprint is drawn up already. And to feel that you are making a poor choice and a poor decision 
it will look like that from your standpoint of the intellect and logical thinking. But as far as the unified field is concerned, that particular misapplied, ill-chosen decision is a necessary process for you to go through to develop immunity in your individuality. All of them? All of them. <laughs> because that is where the principle is, the script is written, the producer puts up the money, the director pushes you from every angle for you to act, get the best for the movie, but you are a qualified actor. And what is qualified in each of us as a qualified actor is the sense of individuality. What is the producer in all of us? That's the intuition and breath of life. What is the director in all of us is that intellect, that memory bank. Your five senses is part of your individuality that you have to respond to the script. The script is written, it's called the horror scope, or the scope of the horror. <laughs> but if you live it moment to moment, and you act your role out apart to how it is set up without complaining, you get the spiritual asker. It's called cellular immortality. Then you are God, not a God, totally free in a miniature model going through the entire cosmos, enjoying the reality of the accomplishment within the temple. Build me a temple, <coughs> not a wooden one, a cellular, mm. conscious, thinking organism. Build it. Give it its true identity and reality. Take that five senses, take that intellect, take that logic and reason, and work with that intuition and memory to pull up and bring about the impossible known as the permanent nature of the cells. It's already locked up in chemistry. Man on this planet is a carbon-based body. We have space brothers and sisters they don't have carbon-based bodies, but they would like to get yours. <laughs> <laughs> don't fool yourself. And they would play every trick in the book to get it. They don't want to go through the uterine canal to be born to forget their memory of their ability to work with the conscious control of the atom. Knowing fully well, that we have already volunteered to come in, to work it out. Now, this may sound strange. We haven't been here for the first time, so don't go fool yourself, this is the first time you'll be here. We've been here many times, but we are the ones who were are originally in the first creation, in a silicon, sulfur, or methane body. We goofed at our first Star Wars, and now we had to clean up the cosmos through our mistakes. We were given a compensatory restitution by being offered the carbon-based body to clean up the universe. That's the second creation, where we come in and volunteer with this type of body, but we aren't told that this type of body is the most unique. But we're told if we work hard and don't use our ego and our magical capabilities, we will warrant permanency. That is why it's written to him that overcome it, overcome it, all that ego drive and egotism and personality moods. I will not send forth a second time. You will have the permanency control of the atomic structure. But then when we look at the, the reality, all around the chemistry of us, only a carbon-based body can accomplish this. 
And we see models of it around us between the moth and the butterfly. And between those who have gone ahead of us. We have evidence of those who have come and gone and we can't prove they were here. We still puzzle how they did it. But we got evidence of those who ain't going no place but they are rotting no matter how they try. So we see that we have something locked up in us, but we got to become conscious of what it is. And it's not something to be afraid of phasing down temporarily, temporarily, the who in you for the what you are. And when you know what you are, then you could play any who you like. When you don't know what you are, playing who you think you like is fooling yourself. So first know what you are. Then the options to play the various who's and the hues of the who. Because who is it for in the first place? Who are you entertaining in the first place? Creative intelligence, God. Not a person sitting on a throne waiting for dead people. <laughs> you know, I fell off a building and died. <laughs> I went to heaven and hell and then find no God sitting there. But the funny thing is this, when I arrive at heaven, pearly gates, beautiful, gosh, and all that sort of thing. That's what they told me it was. But then I wanted to see the other side of the pearly gates, so I pushed through the door. And I look on the other side and I saw all the oyster shells waiting to be cleaned up. Uh -huh. Then I went to hell and I saw the burning gates and I can't get through. But out of sheer <laughs> craziness of the persistency, I push against the fire wall. I look on the other side, all the wood cut nice and stack of waiting to keep away. But I didn't see a garden or a devil said, no waiting for dead people. <laughs> I saw myself outside of my body, looking at my broken body, in craziness all around me. Those who've gone ahead, looking, I said, well, who do you think it is? <laughs> all the saints are there, the wonder dog aren't they? They can't breathe for me. But look at me, and they don't talk with the mouth, they talk with the eyes and say, we love you, but we, can, we don't expect this to work for you or do anything for you. You are you. Moses is the same thing. Moses had to confront burning bush and all these things. What did he confront? In the end, the understanding. Paul confronted when he fell off the horse. The understanding. I live and die daily in the God. Now, last night, many of us went to sleep and we're sound asleep, right? Good. Did you know if you were a man or a woman when you were sound asleep last night? Good. And suppose you didn't wake up, you still wouldn't know who you are. Mm -hmm. You see how vulnerable you are? Huh? That's the key to why we're not concerned with who we are, is what we are. If you know what you are when you sound the sleep, you are free man, lord of yourselves. But until that time, you are going in every kind of notion and hula baloos of heaven and hell, and you have to come back and do like Omar Khayyam. He went through that too. So he went out and said with his consciousness, I sent my soul out to be the invisible. A letter of the afterlife to spell or say what goes on out there. And by and by, my soul came back and said, I myself am hell, heaven and hell. But I go this way and say, I myself is the heaven and the hell because the atom is held inside here by the sonic resonance of 14.7 pounds pressure per square inch outside, 14.6 inside, and it can talk to itself by breathing. And if it doesn't breathe, it is holy dirt. There is no such thing as lousy dirt. Mm -hmm. The elements are totally the manifested God, not the God sitting on a throne. But it'll, this creative principle will take these manifested elements and flip it around again and produce another cellular form to talk to itself. Because there is no way to entertain creative intelligence as a resonance principle in an atomic mass called spirit, nice fancy word, which only means the atomic mass is spinning. 
it doesn't stop. And when it takes a form, of all the forms around, it's this cellular one, was the word or the resonance, sonic resonance, and the word was with God, creative intelligence, that's the blueprint, archetypal patterns, and the word was God, that is conscious action. And the word was made flesh, it slows down as the atoms, they slow down and become tissue, we call it evolution, and it dwells in man. It doesn't dwell in donkey. It doesn't dwell in a tree. But it dwells in this form called man, male and female. And in the book called The Incorruptibles, there are over 366 case histories, 80% are women. So you see, the blueprint that you're talking about and the purpose is creative intelligence wants intellect to accept the simplistic function of slowing down the ego via the individuality to reap the reward of totality of cellular permanency within the atomic structure called immortality or incorruptibility. But that's only one of its qualities. Picture for one moment. On record, there are three of the qualities available. We haven't told the world that there are nine more that you're entitled to. And if you knew the nine more, you'd hurry up and get there. Non-rotting body is one. Take it and leave it. Nobody knows where it's gone. And solidify or liquefy and become visible or invisible at will. Go to the tree. They're on record. What does it mean to solidify and liquefy them? All right. Jesus came to his own disciples after he came out of the, ga the grave. He knocked at the door and asked to allow him to open the door for him to walk in and visit with them. Or he came through the wall. Yeah. Hmm? Good. That's on record. He came through the wall. And the first person to jump up and said, that's a phony baloney figment of your imagination was who? Thomas. He said, this is an apparition. This is fiction. And what did the man Jesus says? Hey, no. Come check it out. Put your hand in the cup and feel and squeeze. You're satisfied? It ain't no imagination? Good. Now give me something to eat. <laughs> then when he finished eat, he didn't do like this. Ta -ta. You know what he did? He finished eat. Ta -ta. And he done. Then, uh, once in a while, you appear visible and solid to Mary and a few other people. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah. You remember me? Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> <Bye -bye. laughs> Go ahead. The, the coming and going at will, because there's so much uh, emphasis put on the body, like you said how it unlocks to the unlimited. So. In a sense, if you um, make a carbon copy or whatever, you could be sitting here now, you could be somewhere else. How would we know the original, or is there any original, in the sense at that point when you're... Because it's created through, uh, like you said, you are God at that point. So you're at one with the creation. Yes. But if I was also at that point over, say, in, um, I don't know, China, um, could I send an image somewhere else and you send an image somewhere else, but certain ones would detect the real? Friend, that is so simple. In the laws of physics, it'll make you realize, if I explain it to you, how limited you place yourself. When Einstein established the speed of light, 
they said it was equal to 186,000 miles a second. He didn't establish energy because the formula is energy is equal to the mass, that's the element and its weight, times the velocity of light squared. That's energy. He was only trying to get the speed of light. How fast does light travel? And it turned out when they dig a whole tunnel one mile long and put a mirror at one end and put another mirror at the other end and put a timer, by the time the sunlight from the sky hit the mirror and went through the tunnel to the other side, they clocked it and came up with the exact mathematical figure of 186,000 miles a second. Then they found out light is not just a beam, that the sun is actually burning out. It's a big firecracker that blew off millions of years ago and particles of it are called photons are, are shooting through space, carrying that little wave and it's burning out. But we live on little planet Earth. China is across the ocean, if at most 8,000 miles. The planet diameter is 8,000 miles in diameter. <laughs> Take 8,000 and divide it into 186,000 and see what you get. You'll end up about 23 times. <laughs> right? Roughly. So you are hitting Mr. Grubacek or any guy in China with your voice. 23 times a second. Only the speed of light. You haven't even used the energy in your body yet. So as far as the physics are concerned, you're selling yourself short. If Milarepa did that when he was living in Tibet, he appeared in 12 temples and they all claimed that they saw Milarepa. They all claimed he died in their temple and they all got a body to show for Milarepa. <laughs> it's still in Tibet today, the temple of Milarepa. It's in 12 locations of Tibet, and they all got 12 bodies from the Arklame. It's, it's Milarepa. Don't sell yourself short. Don't confuse churchianity with Christianity. There's a vast difference between the two. Christianity is the actual science of the cosmos within the temple of the body, this living temple. Churchianity is this one. And there was a story one time, a fellow used to work in a church and came Christmas and he wanted to go to church with his family. And so he asked the father if he could come. Well, the father wouldn't say anything. So the day of Christmas came, he and his family came, and he got to the stair of the church, and the father saw him coming, and he realized what the, would be the problem. So the father came out and says, John, you know what you are, and I know what I am. And this church is what it is, and I don't think it would be appropriate for you to come into the church. So John was, and his family were in a quandary and disappointed. So he went out into the yard and he sat down. And all the other people were going in. And there is John and his family sitting there. The gate, the doors were closed and the ceremony had begun. And to his amazement, he saw Jesus walking from the lawn to the church. It says to him, what's the matter, John? He said, well, I thought you were inside the church. He says, I never got in there for the little built. Never got in there? He said, I never got in there from the day it was built. Oh, from the day it was built. So you see, there's a difference between churchianity and Christianity. John saw Jesus, the real Jesus. And Jesus, when he was in the body, visibly talking to his disciples, those that I have to see, let them see. And those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Many of us got eyes, but we don't see a dog, aren't they? Because he's standing right in this room behind you. And that's no joke. We 
We live in such an illusion of fixation of our five senses that when the actual truth of the atomic physics begins to confront us, we missed out. None of the realized brothers and sisters can go any place away from now. You know where now is located? Hmm? Everywhere? Like to mean it. Now, where is it located? <laughs> hmm? Right here. Good. So where can they go? Are they looking at you? But you can't see them? Because they told you already. Those that have the eyes to see mean it opened up to look at it through the convex vision and not the concave vision. Let them see. And those that have ears to hear or hear through the cellular audition will hear the music in the room. Glory, glory, hallelujah. But if you can't hear it, I can't help you. All I can tell you is this. To see it and hear it, you got to slow down your brain. There is no other technique. Brother Jesus doesn't give you the technique, but we don't use it. The technique is simple. When the eyes, plural, two of them here, are single, look inside <laughs> and don't analyze with your brain, this whole cellular structure of body is full of light. <laughs> Try it sometimes, see it how it looks. Beautiful out colors. And the light is shining in the darkness. That means the tissue that controls it. And that tissue doesn't comprehend a single thing because it isn't intended to analyze nature. It's a result of nature slowing down to become tissue. But let your light so shine. That means well, just watch it, be a witness. That's why they call you Jehovah's Witness. They don't call you a thing more, which is the oxygen coming through your nose and you look at it. Let your light so shine before men, not donkeys. <laughs> That's other human beings like yourself. And they will see the glow, which is caused by the phosphorus in the skin, to indicate that you're spending time to look inside. Glow a little, glow warm, glow, glow, glow. <laughs> glow in the darkness, when you know. <laughs> and they will glorify the Creator in you, which is God. And then they will want to tap in on their own creativeness, which is God. There is no a God or the God. There is God becoming his creation out of a unified process, expressing as individuality. So look around in the room. We are like spokes in a big wheel. <laughs> We're not connected to Mama. And if we were connected to Daddy, we wouldn't go out in the first place to be formed as a human being. So you see, individuality is totally atomic. But because of that, it cannot be revoked. It has to function with the unified principle. It has to confront and rebel against the unified principle. It has to be ushered into. So the best way to make it respond in order for it to achieve the highest accomplishment is tell it, don't do this. <laughs> Knowing fully well you can do it, and I want you to do it to you good and mock up that I'm going to say, ha. <laughs> now you respect yourself, clean up your act. Yeah. So the form is strictly a result of the consciousness. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> so you were talking about you gave us three, well, maybe we can get some more. <laughs> On how we can boogie these atoms around, because it's like, if they're strictly, when you say take atomic structure with you, we're not talking about this. Yes. You're talking about what this is made of, yeah. or the atoms, right? But this particular shape and particular substance is the ultimate manifestation that the creative intelligence decided upon to look like. Okay, so in other words... Cellular. So there's not a sixth no. element? No. All right. Okay, so then when you're talking about taking this, you're t I mean, I would imagine there are parts of the creation where this would not be a very uh, economical vehicle. No. Right? No. No? No. 
In every part of creation, this is the ultimate, the carbon-based cellular form. I said already, you had three. Silicon base. If you ever seen a silicon base, it clear light flashes right through, you call them an angel. A sulfur base, you may call them some one of those ET things that pass through, and you may call them aliens from outer space. Or they met in when they walk through the roofs, they'll stink like hell. <laughs> We do have a stinky fart, mm -hmm. because we're carbon-based too. But we have one advantage when you look at the, the laws of physics. Silicon will make glass. It'll allow light to pass through, but it's fragile next to a diamond. It will last for eternity, but it's not strong as a diamond. It will never outlast a diamond. A diamond will cut it to pieces. So an angel doesn't have any power over you when you achieve what? The diamond. the diamond quality in yourself by accepting the God in you now. That puts you above the angel. That's why they say God made man a little less than the angel in order for him to work up to be greater than the angel. And the little less was he put him in a carbon-based body versus silicon-based body in the relationship to the light process and the sonics. So, by virtue of that, his ego acts like a charcoal to block him. Mm. And then when he dumped the ego and accept the reality of his divinity and cut out, trying to show off with his mouth and start living what he says, he restores his divinity again. And then the God is glorified. Superman emerges out of Clark Kent. Born again. So does the Born angel, again? Great. Does the angel then, the angels, would they have the understanding of this? Of course. So, but they envy you. Pardon? They envy you. And so they wait to take on the carbon base. Yes. But you see, they have a job already. Oh. Their job is to be a nurse maid. Mm -hmm. oh. So, oh, when, everybody, when each one makes it, that does the service for them so that they can take on? Yeah. Wow. You see, creative intelligence did not make the angel to be its offspring. He made the angel to be a servant. He made you, the carbon-based body, to muck up, clean up, and be its offspring and its own true nature to focus back to itself. Therefore, it chooses the carbon-based body to rise above all other forms in creation. Brother Jesus came, he lived it, and he's left it as a memento to that process. He hasn't done it in a silicon body, he didn't do it in a sulfur body, and he didn't do it in a methane body. He came down into the carbon-based body, went through the pain and the anguish, in order to show that the carbon-based body is the highest model left as restitution for disobedience, which was already planted in the consciousness to do. Mm. We were designed to disobey in mm. order to reap the value of a higher type of body to transcend all those who were hired with Big Daddy. You see, you and I are his children. We are not his employees. Mm. Mm. So, Don, an autobiography, when I think it was Yukteswar, went on vacation and he helped those work from the astral into the causal. Yeah. Um, would that be like... Um, He's getting rid of their charcoal. Would they be like methane, silicon, or whatever mm, right, base exactly. that he's working with? They were right. But what's the causal? Causal is only the uh, shift between the light frames. You have, how do you store data in your brain? What mineral or element retains data? Zinc. Hmm? Zinc. No. Silicon. Silicon. You can't make a computer and store any information in the zinc. <laughs> it ain't gonna work. Silicon. And that's why you're always silly. I mean, you miss fire in there. It sounds comical, but you are a silicon-based mechanism inside, but you 
total structure is carbon-based, which is superior. That's why we say until you know some of the basic laws of physics in solar nutrition, advanced levels of solar nutrition becomes very technical because we're not here to eat and sleep. We came here to go through that process. So that we don't have to eat and sleep. Why, do well, you why, would, you, why would your brother come and take a test for 40 days or 40 nights to do what? <coughs> what was his first test? He's fasting, you know, he's not eating. And then he's challenged by his own in the ego. Why are you fasting, man? Why don't you eat? Why are you showing off? <laughs> and then he says, get uh, man only by bread alone, but by every word that proceed out of the mother God. This carbon-based body doesn't need to eat, but as long as you feel you have to, you'll do it. That's your option, that's your individuality. When you rise above it, it wouldn't be eating. Now, okay. So, he tells us how to live without eating. Lock in to the sonic resonance through the motor god known as the hypothalamus in our brain. Every doctor knows you can operate it. You stick it up in, you're dead instantly. You stick it to the feather, you're per permanently paralyzed. No doctor going to monkey there. Any other part, they're going to talk make parts back. But that part, no. We got that locked into us as a fact. The next test is, okay, daddy, throw it. And what is it? Attention getting syndrome. Nobody likes me, so I'm going to kill myself. Throw yourself over this and you're going to send angels, nice boys to catch you. When I was a kid, started to be a priest. I used to be like, like calling, come on, bro, you just jump. <laughs> and then I would laugh, laugh at my own ignorance with myself at the end. It's the attention getting syndrome. We feel that nobody likes us, so what we want to do? Commit suicide and get lost. <laughs> but then he had an answer. We don't have a right to kill ourselves because we don't give ourselves life. Even if you're a carbon base or a silicon base or a, a methane or a sulfur based body, you can't give yourself life. So stop feeling left out and look at the fact that you're a winner. <coughs> And that's the fact. So all that attention getting, poor me attitude, you take it and throw it in the garbage and start breathing. And so he overcome that second test of feeling sorry and miserable about himself. Then the third test is when you don't feel sorry for yourself and you don't feel you, you have to kill anybody to eat, You'll want to have all you can possess to make you feel what? Important. By that time you realize you know, if you fall asleep and you don't wake up, what possession can you keep that will make you important? You goofed again. So he says, get thee behind me, Satan, my ego brain. This is a Satan with my <laughs> aggravation. No one can really own anything in this universe because it's atoms working in different speeds, creating an illusion of solidity for the mere sensitivity of touch. Now, the schizophrenic person sees this room as a nebulous curtain of light and feels very disoriented. Years ago, when I first had to meditate, and Yogananda told me, you got to go down and slow your brain down for 15 minutes before you can never get to that state. For seven and a half minutes in Delta, you're schizophrenic. No drugs in this world can match it. <laughs> you can take out the drugs, you don't even come close to that little level. But everything here is, and you're like you're falling through the floor. <laughs> then the next seven and a half minutes, every saint in the world call it the night of the soul. That means total blank. There's not a single thing you can't even... You ever been in a cave? You can't even see your hand? Picture for one moment, you, for seven and a half minutes you're walking around in your room with the lights turn on and you don't even see you. When you look in the mirror, you don't even exist. <clears throat> for seven and a half minutes, and that is the night of the soul. Then you go the next minute, if you make it through that level, you come out, they call you Swami, master of yourself. This is master of yourselves, because you, right then you hear and you see for the first time, without all doubt, 
how this permanent ovum bonded is called the cellular atomic detonation in your brain, where it connects to, this, to hook the spine to the skull. You relive that moment of the memory, and you know what Jesus says, free man all, Lord of yourself. Then you can function in this world. <coughs> So the breathing uh, in, in autobiography too, he goes on and just, you know how you always say, breathe, boy, breathe? You say that, so then when I was reading the book and it, and it said how we go, it go, you go beyond the breathing state and I went, breathe, boy, breathe, and I couldn't put the two together. It's yeah. because the breathing, you slow it down by breathing That's and right. then it stops at a certain point? Yes. Where you're not breathing? That's right. No. The pause between the inhalation and the exhalation, which is the actual laws of physics involved in the respiration, is the key known as suspended animation or otherwise known as total awareness. Not total intellect. Don't go confusing the two words. Awareness is not intellect. Awareness is Hologramic vision, where you see through the front of your head with your eyes, and you see through the back of your head with your eyes, above the sky with your eye, head, top of your skull, and it's looking all the way down into there's not a point in space you don't see. Full circle. But you're not a smart, know it all person. You could be the biggest dumb junk in the world, but you see the whole of the universe totally as it is. It don't make me any smarter than you or make you any more foolish than me. Is that is what we call seeing truth for the first time. It's called enlightenment. It's an experience that has nothing to do with intellect. It has to do with realizing your totality And you couldn't shift a single moment of your best friend in the room as to falling over a rock and hurting his nose. You couldn't even do a single thing to stop it. You just have to watch it and laugh. And if you try to tell it to him before he asks you, you'd be imposing upon his individuality and his privacy to be a human being. And that's why even they tell you, God, would not interfere with your individuality. You yourself must surrender it by your own consent to say, come in God, come in totalness, look in through me, my intuition, and let me function. So Jesus went to the garden of Gethsemane. He wanted to know what gonna be his time frame, and he saw, nailed on a cross. Then he says, no, why should I do for this? Father, remove this cup. But then he saw, if he went through it, the possible potential of the total experience of rising above it. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He persevered to transcend the trial of his ego by virtue of the intuitive nature called the Christ. He succeeded to this day. He is a model for all those who want to per persevere. All I can answer the same is, from my personal experience, rule number one, don't panic. Rule number two, don't panic. Rule number three, don't panic. Just hang in there, you'll make it. And you're panicking in that schizophrenic state. When you panic, you'll do like uh, Judas. You go hang yourself. That's panic. you commit suicide, that's panic. If you don't panic, you hang in there, you'll transcend. But you got to trust the fact that your atomic physics are designed to give you the result. It's tough, I don't say it's easy. It's, the, it's kind of the proper attitude, urgency about it once you're initiated, or I think it's kind of like, or is it patience? The actual virtue 
that emerges out of the experience is calmness, not patience, nor the other word you use. Urgency. It, but while you're trying to get there, should you try to, do you just think it? Eastern <laughs> uh, yogis and saints, they use a word called anandam, which means bliss. Therefore, they refer to the experience as existence, meaning actual individual disconnectedness from each other. You exist in it. Consciousness, total hologramic vision, no intellectualization. But the value of this in awareness is the bliss, which has I'll name just three qualities of the bliss. I don't name all the rest because one, non decomposition of the body. Two, the ability to take the body and go through the atomic field and leave your brothers and sisters to wonder if you ever were there at all. Three, to reappear and be visible and solid and liquefy again at will. Making your brothers and sisters realize they are nothing but crystallized, slow down molecules of light by their own fixation of their individuality to wherever they think they have to be or look like. Why can't we have some more? <laughs> you weren't able to handle it. <laughs> Just one? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Omnipresence is the third state because God is what? Omnipresent. And therefore, you would be experiencing omnipresence. And omnipresence gives you the next state. Omniscience, mm. that is the all-knowingness, not all-intellectualism. <clears throat> and then omniscience gives you omnipotence. That's the next thing. Well, what are you going to do with all this power now? Slow down to what? Individualize it again. So the game and the joy of the game between creative intelligence and its sense of being is playing the role of individuality all the time. There is no more fun or joy to God, the creative intelligence, than to slow down and be an individual. So it's that infinite loop. Right. So it oh, loves no. to play this game of individuality. So, Donna, why do some people have in the Eastern, some of the teaching give you that feeling like as if you're going to go out of that loop. You know what I mean? To yes. me, the loop's great because you're you go out of it. You go out of your individuality to experience your totality. Okay. And then you come back into your individuality because you understand totality is already individuality. But you'd be doing The skin it of the banana is necessary for the banana. You can't eat the skin, you gotta eat the banana. You can't grow the banana without the skin. So what happened? That's exactly what we are. The skin of the banana is our individuality. Our divinity is the banana. But we can't have the banana without the skin. You can't have totality without the individuality. So that's why you can laugh and be in bliss because you're playing the game consciously. That's the, diff to. that's the only difference. Right. When you're playing it without knowing why, the who's always going, who am I, when am I, blah, 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 and it's always frustrating. Yes. But once you realize, the whole thing's a game. It's great. That God has only two sons. Mm -hmm. When you cry, it goes like this. <laughs> now, that's crying, right? <laughs> when you're laughing, ha ha ha, ha ha ha, ha ha ha, any change in the sound? One is just thawing out and the other is just what? <laughs> Heating up. <laughs> <laughs>
You see? So, ha ha ha, is a resonance going on inside of you, and it's called the big laugh. Creative intelligence is having the biggest laugh by becoming his own creation via individuality called manifestation. Come, let us, that is the sonics and the optics within an atomic mass become a manifestation. Now let me ask you another question for the first time. What is matter? God in manifestation. You see, we use the word, but we don't even realize what we got. How do you write the word matter? Oh, matter. Matter. M A T T E R. That's where you write it. Why don't you write it this way? M A T T E R. And then you'll see something about it. M is moving. A is atoms. T is timeless. T transformation. E emission. R recurrence. There is no matter in this universe other than moving atoms timelessly transforming emission recurrence. Mm. And mind over it? You write mind this way. M, I, N, D, right? Mm. Why don't you write it M, I, N, D and see what you got. M is memory and more of me. Thou shall have no other God before the me or the memory. In is the I internally. That's where it's stored up. N is navigating, directing, monitoring. And D, the detonation of the atom, or the desire to interact of attraction and repulsion by polarity, or the decision to loss up. So mind over matter is whatever the memory decides to detonate over the moving atom. So whatever you say to the atom, shut up, it will shut up. So if you have faith, like a grain of mustard seed, that means the attractive repulsion acceptance within your mouth, the size of a mustard seed, you can say to the atom or the mountain that the atom is made up, move, the mountain will move. That's just a slow down atom looking like a mountain. <laughs> but how many mountains can you move before you create earthquakes and uh, continents and our uh, planets going to pieces? So you see, we find out that it's not always the miracle that makes us important. It is going through the process of accepting all the conflicts thrown into our lives to rise above their limitations through love. Mm -hmm. And then we are free from that particular process to have what is called a cellular permanency that allows us to work in and out of the atom without emulsifying in the atom. Mm. You see, that's the thing. If you don't master that state of permanency, they constantly bear you over and over and over and over. It's called emission recurrence. Or reincarnation is not a fancy word for the module. <laughs> and you come back till you get one module where you would what? Accept. I love you, it's the best thing you got. Mm. See, so be, uh, Moses was told, take your shoes off, this is the holy ground. Mm. Burning bush? Third eye, no place. Not something outside, it was his own self he had to confront. But then, when he saw inside of himself, and he heard the voice inside say, I am that I am. 
I want you to go tell those people down there to let my people go. Well, you know that can be highly impossible to go tell some fixated person that the I am sending you <laughs> to tell us to let these guys go. Oh, come on. <laughs> but Moses realized he couldn't tell them that. He needed some kind of name to trigger these people to act. So the internal voices tell them Jehovah sent you. And when you broke down the word Jehovah, it breaks down into these three letters. I, period, D, period, A, period, I, D, E, A. I, period, D, period, E, period, A, period, E, Hova. Now, put it into English, take away the periods. What is I, D, E, A? Now, is there anything greater than an ID? Now, think of this ID. You are chosen to lead these people out of this building. <laughs> now, see how you can get worked on. <laughs> That's a fantastic driving force. Hmm. Now, here another idea. Don't you eat that apple. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's another driving force to do it. Eat Repair, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> How ideas are powerful. So, Mr. Carl Jung called it your archetypal patterns of your memory banks. Programming is the new game. And we come back to find that Moses couldn't get those people to move with another idea. So, he used a word to trick them into act by saying, Jehovah sent me. So they said, okay, for the sake of Jehovah, let's go. But how can we see Jehovah? Moses, close your eyes. Close your eyes. And Brother Jesus come back and says, it's easy. When you close your eyes, you'll see it. And those that got eyes to see now, let them see, and ears to hear, let them hear. So we're learning that we're atoms, and we can see into the atomic mass. And if we aren't ready to see by that, we're building machineries not to do it. Yeah. Shouldn't we take a break now for about five minutes and then come back and if there are any more questions? Okay. And the basket is going around for donations to help pay for the If rainfall or a rainbow show up, or someone asks the question who is a non initiate, that only initiates know, whoever show up Thursday night will be initiated. But those three things have to occur. One of them rain can either come in the form of snow, too. <laughs> <laughs> But it's one of the three physical, tangible evidence that your love of God is your initiation. Now, if you think of any other thing, I don't have it. And I've been to areas where no rain, no rainbow, no question. And I came back and then there was lots of rain. <laughs> and there were also lots of rainbows mm -hmm. <laughs> and lots of questions. So the time when it's about to happen has a lot to do in many different locations. But they'll tell you. I remember I was in uh, Tucson at the home of my host. They were initiated. Their sons were not. And the next night I was ready to leave. And the night before, the son came up and said to me, he said, I'd like to talk to you. I said, yeah, what can I do? And that was about one o'clock in the morning. He says, I'd like to be initiated. I said, I'm leaving tomorrow night. You know the request is? He said, what is it? I said, if rain fall before I leave tomorrow, or a rainbow show up, or someone asks the question that no one knows, I'll do it. He looked at me, totally despondent. 
and he went off to his room. Me, I went back to my room. This is one o'clock in the morning. Four thirty. <laughs> out of a clear blue sky. The rain is falling like crazy. At six o'clock, he's knocking the door. At that, am I approved? <laughs> <laughs> I say, yeah, man, you're really approved. He says, you know, I've been crying all night with my love for God. Please give me. Oh. I say, you know the technique of initiation. You could do it. Because if you shake up the heavens <laughs> and get it to cry, you don't need nobody to teach you techniques. <laughs> You've got the technique. Remember, Brother Jesus said, if you have faith in me, like a grain of mustard seed, you say unto the mountain, move. The idea that it's not belief but knowing that we ask the person, if one of these three things occur, we know that their love is responsible and therefore their own accomplishment in the present body frame is valid. So it's not a matter of belief, it's a matter of you tapping in on your own reality. So every time you sit down to meditate, and you're feeling left out or in a quandary, relive the experience of the rain or the rainbow, whichever one occurred when you ask. In my case, there was a rainbow in the sky when I asked mine. And then the person told me when they left the body, I was always see you in the rainbow. So whenever I look up in the sky, I look at a certain angle of the rainbow, they're standing there and doing like that. <laughs> that was Yogananda. And me, when I close my eyes to meditate, I don't do no technique more than relive the moment of the rainbow. And then I go inwards, because that's the love. When the love is strong enough for God to give you a visible, tangible approval that you and the principle are one, and it's not belief, it's not, you don't get up to go show off no more, because there's nothing to show off about. You know in your heart, once and for all, life is worth living. Um, so, in other words, God's love and love of God is kind of keep the walls and speak. That's what it is. Love the Lord thy God with all your mind and heart. Mm. And the miracles will happen. But if you're looking for the miracles, how many miracles do you think you can use or do before you can get bored of them? Versus the unconditional love and service for your brothers and sisters around you. Who wants to show off in front of his brother and sister that has the same capacity to do it? Each one of us in this room can do it, but each one of us may talk to themselves that they're incapable of doing it and make another one feel that they got some kind of greater quality, when in actuality that's not true. None of us is any better than the other. We're all equal. It's God. But we got to come to grips with the reality of how to look at ourselves, what we are. You had a question you want to ask? Yes, I was asking earlier. Um, it's been my observation from seeing other people and myself go to saints or masters or enlightened beings that prior to seeing them, all kinds of catastrophes, if you might want to call it, or situations occur almost to prevent them from coming. What's happening in that energy exchange or that approach to that type of energy? You're reliving the requirements which each realized brother or sister will say to you when you meet them. When the student is ready, a master will be there. He didn't say your master will be there. If the people read it correctly, they will see what is involved. When the individual is ready to assume the responsibility of the spoken word, 
a living person who has mastered it, that's a brother or a sister like themselves, will be present to have the opportunity to experience it. But prior to that time of the experience, they will go through every concocted, erroneous mistakes in the world that they will believe life is not worth living. They may want to But up to that point, if you don't panic, it's because there is always that principle in the universe. One of us periodically is emerging into the full realization of what they are, and the others are gradually pulling their heads out of their fixations to check. And maybe they are ready and maybe they are not ready, but in the process of getting ready, the whole world seems to crash in from every angle and block them. We call it incorrect timing. So, in the end, this is what enlightenment adds up to be. Enlightenment is timing of the daily events in your life is the evidence that the creative intelligence is directing survival. Timing of the daily events in your life is the evidence that creative intelligence is directing survival. So wherever you are at that moment, in your timing, if you didn't die in the process, <laughs> you have survived very accurately and completely. Mm -hmm. And that is the point that you have come to realize in the end. You would never have found another person willing to be a model if the timing wasn't working to your survival. You might have crashed up and ended up in a hospital. But since you didn't, you had all these different so-called conditions blocking you and getting you all worked up and then reflecting, why should it happen? My answer is, why should it not happen to you? Mm -hmm. It has to happen to you in order for you to understand that you have to be constantly conflicting around in order to develop proper timing to the incidents in the now. And so when you meet a realized person, he's not, or she is not, going to give you any new magical way to avoid timing, other than to make you conscious that you got there at the right time, and now you will be able to learn to live in the right time. See? So, after that happened to me, I discovered that life was elements of a certain weight and pH factor moving on time all the time, and that my body was a processor of it. Therefore, I eat on time, all the time, and allow everything to revolve around me on time. I then became like a caterpillar, become a butterfly. I refuse to worry about the world anymore because it ain't going to change timing. Timing regulates it and runs it efficiently better than I can think of it. And the car outside, if it ain't time, ain't going nowhere. So if I'm looking for some model or reason or purpose for this universe, I got it right there in the functioning of my environment. You ought to time the bury you. You're on time, they keep you around. And God ain't going to feel sorry for you if you're out of time. All he's going to say, try again. But if you're on time, he pats you on the back and says, keep it up. You got till midnight eternity.
Okay. So, permanency <coughs> and time are the two laws of nature that each individual sooner or later begins to realize are the greatest miracles. You don't have to perform them. They are being performed for you. You got to sit back and enjoy it. Think of it. When the cord was cut, did you do anything within your body to keep the ear in? Not a single thing. No matter how you try, you didn't do nothing. But whatever caused your body to synchronize when the cord was cut with the air in order for you to breathe and function, that principle, that love, is what we're all indebted to. We're indebted to timing. So, from that standpoint, you don't have to panic. You never left out anyhow. So if you feel, by the time you go to see someone, no matter how we build up about them, and all the incidences seem to block it, and then you feel frustrated, it's very necessary for you to go through and understand. And so the, the wise men centuries ago studied a science called astrology. But then they also realized this about astrology. The stars foretell or they don't compel. Mm -hmm. You still have individuality to act out good or lousy decisions. So my sister said to me, Adana, when you know God, all your good and lousy decisions are fulfilled, even if you don't want to follow astrology. <laughs> and you may be hard-headed, but the fact is, the good ones and the lousy ones are all fulfilled. And the lousy ones you learn never to do again. And the good ones you pat yourself on the back, it could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Adana, of the, um, when you, I've always said 144 elements. Um, I was sitting with somebody some day and said 144 elements, and they went, there's like 105. That kind of blew my mind because I took for granted that everybody out there knew about the 144. And then a guy um, in Santa Fe that, that we know said that a book by Bruce Cathy, who's a man, retired Air Force general, and Australia said when they find the 144 elements, they'll then build the crafts that will go beyond light. So I was just what I'm trying to understand is the knowingness of the 144, and if the scientists only know, say, 105, where's that um, in between? They are the radicals. They're the radicals? Yeah. What are radicals? A radical element is an element that will create disruption in an organized process. Mm -hmm. And my friend is studying chemistry now, and he's been exposed to how many you think are going to be functional. We know 105, right? Mm -hmm. 108. Hmm? 108. How much? 108. 108. Okay. Your rosary for centuries have been 108 beads yeah. and 36 radicals make the 144 elements. It takes 108 revolving you on time all the time to keep you normal. And it takes the 36 outside of you to threaten you so that you stay normal. And so the ancient men painted a temple on the walls of the caves. It was called the Nine Gate Temple. And at each gate they put four odd-looking creatures that they called gargoyles and gremlins. 
It was their way to tell their future generation how the body was made up. But because they were using art geometry, most of us never understood what it meant. But this is a ten gate temple. Nine gates are visible. Two eyes, two nostrils, two ears, a mouth, a lower front and back entrance, adding up to nine. Then there is an invisible door right there. That's the door that has to be open from inside, does not go key outside. But the four guardians or radicals, they are called. To some people, they are called radicals. To those who know, they are the guardians that sit here. They are the guardians of immunity. When you act stupid and clog up your system, then they attack you. When you act smart and wise and clean up, they protect you. And that's what you'll find there. In the eye, radical elements sit there to get in. Either side, on the nostril, the ear, the mouth, and the tooth. And so far, they've only discovered two radicals. The rest are very smart. And those are outside the, like outside of the... Right there, there's four schools. Right. They're your guardians, then you behave right. Keep and clean up your body. They're your enemies, when you <coughs> muck up your body. Mm -hmm. So the biblical writers put it this way in agricultural language. Cleanliness is next to godliness. I've changed it and said, cleanliness is godliness, or goodliness, or healthiness. Because God is health. God is immunity. And the way we test a person if they're spiritual is to see if they're practical every moment. So that's the test. If a person says, I'm a spiritual person, good. Prove to me now how practical you are every moment. Mm -hmm. And if they're very practical, they're spiritual. Now, if they say they're, they have achieved their divinity with God, and the way we test them for the divinity in God, he says, let's see how immune you are to disease. And from their immunity, it tells us now, they have achieved their divinity because no radical will penetrate them. And if they say they're enlightened, then we ask them to perform command performance. Command, command performance is anything you ask, they'll do instantly without question. Who in this room is capable of doing command performance? That is to act without question. Then we know if you're enlightened or if you're divine or spiritual. Those are the tests. When you pass those tests, you have arrived. There is no churchianity, because churchianity isn't Christianity. The person said they're spiritual. We test them right away. This is the test. Show us how practical you are every moment. And practical is not fanatical. Practical is not destructive to the self. It has to be compensatory to its own nature. That's being practical. Now, if you say you are divine and you have this wonderful alignment with God, the test that is requested is how immune is your body to a radical disease? And they have demonstrated that people who are in that state, disease don't break them down. And the evidence also shows up even when they lie down and die off, they don't rot. That's how we know they're there. And the last test, if they're enlightened, and that's not say they're intellectual or big genius, they're enlightened, meaning 
The test for them is command performance. Act instantly on re request. You'll get an act. They never question. It's called the unconditional love of service. Our selfless service is not a fancy name for it. So we see the tests are not things that are out of the range of experience, and therefore it has nothing to do with belief. They're actual things that you and I can do. You just have to put yourself to the task. So many people want to be initiated and have a lot of things to offer. I don't know. But while I'm in the air, these are the requirements for initiation. If the rain falls, or a rainbow show up, or someone asks the question, who is a non-initiate, but only initiates know, it's done. So you see, there's no belief system. I have no belief system. It's either you know or you don't know. And those in this room who are initiates will vouch that they love brought their experience, right? Mm -hmm. Good. So anytime they want to reflect or feel they're not getting the best out of their own lifestyle, they better go back and reflect <laughs> upon the approval. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm still experiencing the process. Um, it might see if I understand this correctly, a way be to um, that's how I say. Well, I'll rephrase it. Um, if I can slow my mind down enough, then um, I'll be more able to experience more of that unconditional love. Is that an accurate statement? I'll tell you this. In all my years of uh, internal observation, I have not found mind, but I have found brainwave activity of different speeds interacting with different types of geometry, alphabet, and numbers to allow me to function as an individual. So as far as I know, mind don't exist. Memory, a storage bank, exists, which internally navigates all my decision, desires, or detonate the atom that surrounds me in the form of matter. But I have never found mind. And so a term like that, I don't contribute to because that is belief without knowing. To know and not have an experience is different. To believe and not know is superstition. To know and not have experience is still not valid. But to experience, after knowing what you experience, you don't need no body to convince you that God loves you. If you see the rainfall, when you make a request pertaining to a word called initiation, which only means introduction. And you being a child of God, want to be introduced to your father, God, that created you. That introduction that is set up by a love that no one can do for you but yourself. And that love gives you a visible manifestation in the environment that nobody can manufacture, and that is rain or a rainbow. You know your daddy loves you. Then you got the best way to bargain with him. You see, after I had that experience, I didn't go lying down on my knees and beating my chest, me a cope of my back. 
complain about. No, I found out that my love generated the response in the visual, then my love would take me through. And this is open to all of us. And if those in the room who are initiates have not experienced that particular thing, then they know I'm lying. But they experience it, right? Mm -hmm. So you know you got your best approval and best love ever going to you. You know God. He's not a person sitting on a throne. But he is the creative principle locked up in you that allows you to use a spoken word over the atom in order to fulfill love. That's why Brother Jesus says, love the Lord with all of the mind. That's all the brain waves. And with all of the heart, the pumping of the blood. That's why they said the pure in heart sees God. It was the love that brought this rain out of the sky or the rainbow. Not conversation. And with all of your strength, that's the breath in your nostril. And with all of your soul, that's the 144 elements that make up your body in a state of movement. You and this environment are one. You have proven your love. And your love has rewarded you by approval of showing you that you are its creation and you are its creation. So it validates. So you can say the rain is cosmic tears of joy and the rainbow is the kiss of love, the lipstick on your face. <laughs> However you want to look at those two manifestations is a mama and a papa loving you. Yeah. So the my friends to me is the question come first. And then if I say the question with that kind of love, then that would be the response. Who stated the question is or ask the question. Yes. That's it. Simple. Very simple. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess we should get this straight. Bird's hand doesn't doing all.